welcome to the Meditation Conversation, the podcast to support your spiritual revolution. I'm your host, Kara Goodwin, and today I'm joined by Clementine Moss. Clementine is the founder and drummer of Zapparella, with a busy solo career as a singer and songwriter. Her book, From Bonham to Buddha and Back, The Slow Enlightenment of the Hard Rock Drummer, uses her career as metaphor for contemplative practice. Clementine is a spiritual counselor and a non-denominational minister. She uses modalities such as depth hypnosis, applied shamanism, and energy medicine in her healing practice. So welcome, Clem. I'm so excited to be with you today. Thank you so much, Kara. I'm so excited for our conversation. So you have such an incredible background and such an interesting diversity in terms of your interests and how you express yourself. So tell us a little bit about your background with the music and with all the healing modalities and how they all have found you. Yeah, yeah. After listening to your podcast religiously for the last few days, I feel like my story is pretty boring (laughs) compared to (laughs) a lot of the folks. Who've been on. I guess the reason that I'm here on the podcast is I'm talking because the book is talking about the connection between um, contemplative practice and being in the world, right? So I think that for a long time in my life, and I think for a lot of people, we see meditation and contemplative practice as a way to escape, right? We're struggling, we're in pain, and we can find that lodi wonderful place outside of ourselves and and mistakenly believe that's the point of things and because i'm a rock and roll drummer and am very in the world when i'm playing rock and roll i wanted to write something that that kind of showed my journey from that place of escape and finding all of that uh, the space within myself that i could kind of avoid myself to coming to a point over time of understanding that actually the purpose of contemplative practice is to be more fully in the world. And and so that's kind of the story. I started playing, I found meditation, Vipassana meditation, and drumming when I was 27 years old. So I started late in life. At the same um, time? Around the same time. Isn't yeah, I went to my first, yeah, my first 10 day meditation retreat. Um, silent retreat and then um, drumming happened around that in the same year and I thought oh, here I am I have this part of myself and this part of myself and oh, I'm going to be the rock and roll drummer on tour living in a van and having this life and then in the morning when I wake up having this secret little you know other part of myself but over time I just realized it's just all clam it's just all one yeah. thing <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that and a question that comes to mind with the drumming, like marrying the drumming and the contemplative practice, have you done anything with like shamanic drumming or any kind of expression in that way? Yeah. So uh, several years ago, I studied the shamanic practice and am now a, an applied shamanic practitioner. The modalities of uh, depth hypnosis is a modality out of a school here in Berkeley, California created by Isaguchi Arty, which marries uh, traditional shamanism, Buddhism, especially Tibetan Buddhism, which has a basis in shamanism, and uh, Western uh, psychotherapy. So especially uh, transpersonal psychotherapy, which believes that spirit is an aspect of healing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a beautiful modality. And in that process of studying all of that, I realized that I'd been coming to the for my whole life, and I had taken a circuitous route through rock and roll drumming, right? Um, because that was my background. That's I grew up with a father who loved that kind of music, and then when I started playing music, that was the kind of music I played. But there was always, from the time I picked up drumsticks, there was always something that felt deeper than just learning how to be a rocker. And so when I came to my first class learning the shamanic method and the drum came out, I was like, oh, now I get it. Thank you, universe. Now I'm starting to understand. So, yeah, sound healing, drum healing, 
those are things that can train. Yeah, I love it. I personally have not experienced shamanic drumming yet, but I've been on the lookout for it because I am very curious about it. I mean, even I remember from being a child and hearing like percussion and the way that it felt. The song Tusk, for example, Mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Fleetwood Mac, you know, listening to that. I remember being a kid and just being like, there was something about the drumming that was like, so I just really wanted, I just really wanted that experience. And so I keep, I keep trying to tune in locally because I want to do a live kind of shamanic drum circle or not even shamanic, but just like, I, I feel like a drum circle would be really beautiful medicine. So. Yeah. The drum has so much magic. You know, there's this really wonderful book um, called When the Drummers Were Women. I can never remember the name of the author. She's passed away now, but she was an amazing author, a woman who fell into drums the way that I did. I didn't, I didn't expect it. She was just interested in it and ended up traveling around the world, studying all of the different, the history of the drum and realizing that drummers were women for going back, I think, 80,000 years, they can find an image of a drum. The drum is one of the first images in some of the oldest artwork. Petroglyphs. And, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and it was used um, during childbirth. Uh, people would, uh, the women would play the drums during childbirth for their, uh, the person giving birth. And um, it was in all of the ceremonies, all of the rituals. And it was the women who were doing that. And it wasn't until I think the when Christianity came in, they outlawed women playing drums because it was a symbol of shamanic practice. Mm. And so for a long time, even up until today, drums were seen as very masculine, right? Mm-hmm. We we experience it as a masculine instrument yeah. because of the outward display of power, but, but that's not how it's been. Yeah. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about this convergence between the music and your spiritual life. It, especially the hard rock part with the, you know, there's this like kind of softness with the contemplative practice, the pasana. And then of course it's hard rock. (laughs) So it seems very kind of two opposite ends of the spectrum. But it seems that they're very woven in your own practice and journey. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So, gosh, there are so many places to take that. But I will say that when we're in a meditation and we're um, sitting still and we're observing without reacting, right, which that's what insight meditation, vipassana meditation, that's the med- meditation, form of meditation I've been doing for 30 years or so. And when you're sitting there watching the way that your your mind is constantly bringing you, like pushing things away, right? The aversion, um, wanting things to be different, the craving, and just the ignorance of believing that those things are you, right? That is you. That can be some of the most difficult work that we ever do, right? And I'm going to a 10-day silent retreat where you're sitting for 12 hours a day in meditation in pain because you're sitting on a floor. For me, I'm a Viking, right? I get, sit on the floor and it's I'm, it's not a natural <laughs> place for me to do. So my body's in pain. But then you recognize that when your mind is ups- unsettled, your body becomes unsettled in pain. You start to see the body-mind rea- connection there. I will say that some of the most intense battles I've ever had in my life is sitting quietly and some of the most pain, some of the most struggle, because all of my struggle is rising up to be met. And so when I'm playing hard rock for many years, I believed that it was anger that was fueling the drumming in a way right? I was playing in a band long ago that the music was very aggressive and and there was a frustration and anger uh, wanting to kind of break out of uh, traditional norms. And there was a lot of that kind of fiery energy behind. 
And I see that in those early times of me going to those meditation retreats and really seeing it as a battle the whole time I was there. And then over time, I started to connect with when, you know, the front attention of your mind is in that battle, you begin to become more and more aware of that where there is no battle, where there's never been a battle, that which is still and unchanging, eternal and present and peaceful and there with you. And we see that in the most chaotic moments of our life. I think about being in a car accident, say, and being in that state of shock, you know, of, of the unexpected. What is it that carries me through? What is it that, that still and all knowing in, in those places, even though my mind can't even think straight, right? My, my everything is so uprooted. And the more that I engaged in that daily sitting down battle, the more that wider awareness began to, to flower and to open. When I'm sitting in meditation in behind the drum set and I'm trying, I'm giving it my all, I'm exerting myself as much as I can, I came to realize that if I connected to that which doesn't not change, that energy that is always there, there's always this, it's like a battery, even steady energy within me. If I drum from that place, then I'm drumming from a place of joy. And when I drum from a place of joy, I can play forever. I have infinite stamina. And and then it's as if the song is now playing me. It mm -hmm. becomes effortless. And I really see that as a great metaphor for us just living our life. Like, what if we walk down the street? What if we drive in traffic and we're really in that centered place, that, that kind of even, that even energy? Um, what's it like to move through the world like that? Where we're feeling everything fully and yet we always understand that these are things that rise and pass through us. We're not attaching ourselves to these things. Again, not to, to avoid it. Oh, when I'm in traffic and somebody does something really dumb and I see that flare of anger rise up in me, I can feel it, but then I can also just as immediately watch it kind of move through me and be like, oh, look, Clem got mad, <laughs> you know. So, so yeah, so I guess that's the, those are the connections that I make is yeah. finding that place. I love that. And you keep coming back to this, uh, this embodiment and the non bypassing, um, because that can be something that, that can be a trap that we can get in. I've, I've experienced that myself in my own path where I don't want to experience the kind of lower things within me. And so I, rather than feel them, I deny them and I like hold them at bay. And I think that is like a more evolved version of me. And it's taken time for me to understand that is part of the expression and it passes just like what you're saying. If I let myself have that anger or frustration or sadness, grief, whatever it is, let it move through me, notice it moving through me, letting myself be human and having that experience and also being able to look at it from a place of witnessing and observing and, and trying not to get entangled in like, I am that, but rather like I am feeling that. And, and then we allow it to move through us. And ideally it completes its process so that we're not burying it. Because of course, what happens when we don't allow it to be expressed and when we deny it is it's like it's not that it doesn't get into our field it's mm -hmm. just that we don't express it we don't it doesn't process and then we just cover it up i'm sure you see that a lot in the different healing modalities that you you practice because you do deep hypnosis and um, and you mentioned like your shamanism and energy medicine and so forth so i'd love to dive in a little bit into those modalities because I'm curious, like, are these things that you use in your own practice or are you, do you work with clients in this way or how did those show up in your work? First of all, I just want to say, I love the way that you said that, that, that we don't 
um, that we really do want to feel the things we want to be present in our life. And I think the reason that we want that is so you know, if I can really feel all of the feels, right, all of the things in my life, what it does is it opens up a level of compassion, both for myself, for going through it, which then does what I think the whole purpose of all of the spiritual practices is to open up compassion for the other, right? That's and beautiful. to realize how much our own struggles we see other people are going through. You know, it's when we really connect to how much pain is where is there for us to feel and experience and we realize gosh these people, everybody walks with this i'm no different then we can really open our hearts i think i love so, that yes great point yeah yeah so yeah so i do work with clients you know depth hypnosis has been shown to be really great with ptsd and depression anxiety so I do have uh, clients that I work with, and I love working with clients. I don't have too many these days because my was funny. As soon as I started really working with a lot of people, suddenly my creative life started to get stronger, which I've heard can happen sometimes when we do these things. Like I was working so hard to open myself up to be a benefit to others. What happened was my own stuff started to get stronger and clearer but but I do work with clients and I love it because I really believe in the modalities that I work in and you know depth hypnosis is seen as a way of I'm using traditional shamanic method like soul retrieval power retrieval energetic interference clearing things but but the goal is to help the client become their own shop so I have been trained in traditional shamanic techniques, and I can do that for people who maybe there are having so much difficulty that they can't really focus on going on a journey themselves. And so I can do those kind of clearings, but I find it much more powerful to work in a session and helping people to go and understand their own internal metaphoric system. I can go and I can retrieve power for someone and bring it back to them and bring it into the top of the head the way that the traditional work is done and that can be really powerful for people but it's even more powerful for them to go on their journey and to connect with uh, co collect their power that they've lost or that has been taken away and bring it back on their own and have me help to incorporate it. So that's why I really love the way that I was taught these things because the integrity of power is vitally important. And these days, shamanism is really a buzzword. And I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about power. And if the work that you're doing is not empowering you, but is instead asking you to give your power to something or someone or or a modality i think it's time to think think a lot about whether or not that's a benefit because what we're doing is we're coming into our own personal power our own understanding of ourselves and when i go on a shamanic journey i'm seeing my shamanic realm and those things those guides that i have those images that i'm shown they mean something to me um, if I see an eagle, that eagle means something to me that it might mean something different to someone else. Everybody has their own imagery. Mm -hmm. and I really believe that's the way, the best way to work this way. Yeah, I could not agree more. And I love pr coming across practitioners who are wanting to help people to connect with their own power. I personally am seeing it more and more and more. As I connect with people, I hope that's a reflection that more and more practitioners are adopting that style rather than I'm the guru and you come through me and then I'm the intermediary between you and source or you and whatever. I think we're that's an outdated system and maybe it held a place when the planet was in a different place vibrationally where maybe we needed that intermediary in a different way than we do now. But I feel that 
it's really, really important that um, people that we look to to help us to heal are pointing us back to ourselves. And it doesn't mean that there's not a role for somebody to help us do that, because mm -hmm. depending on where we are in our journey, that can be really important. If we're teachers are wonderful. Yes. Like, teachers are wonderful. Yeah. Right. But it's it's really important that we don't like you say, hand over our power to say, oh, okay, the best thing, you know what this eagle represents for me. And I think it takes dedication within ourselves too to also reclaim that within ourselves because so often we're so ready to be like, well, what does that mean? What does mm -hmm. that mean? Yeah, yeah. And we want somebody's interpretation for it. And it's like, okay, that can be helpful and keep yeah. keep going with yourself. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm curious. You, in passing, said, mentioned <laughs> that you're a Viking, and this keeps coming back to me. I would love to know about this. How do you see yourself as a Viking? What does that mean to you? <laughs> I just, I mean that my family has a Nordic past, so my hips are not as, as pliable, I think, <laughs> Eddie, from... Other, Is that a other trait? ethnicities. I think really? so. The yeah, hips are I not as so. pliable. Okay. At least, yeah, at least for me. Yeah. And I've oh. heard it uh, for other people say that too. And I think it's just culturally, you look at Asian cultures where it's very common for people to sit cross legged on the floor and mm -hmm. you don't see that a lot in tall, tall people. Warriors. <laughs> this yeah. is what's so funny because. Your, is it your handle on, or your website, uh, Clem the Great? <laughs> and then you do have, at least from, maybe it's the lighting, but I think you've got reddish hair. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you've got, I'm like, oh, yes, I totally see. You are a Viking. <laughs> and then you've got this warrior-ness about you, too. Like, ah, there's so many different, like, layers and levels that that plays on. And then now you've got, like, your genealogy and... <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? I love it. You know what's really funny is the first time I ever did. So past life regression always really fascinates me, right? Me too, so yeah. the way that I do, I was trained to to guide people in past life regression is really we do it following a symptom of something that we're looking to heal in this life, and we follow that symptom back. So it it's not what we call past life tourism, right? We're not going back just to see Ooh, what were we. But the first time I ever did past life regression, that I did that past life tourism, which was really fun and really great. But the funny thing is, I went and we were to see our most spiritual life, our most recent life, right? These are the two lives that we were to go to. And both of them were, one, I saw myself as a Native American woman, and the other, I saw myself as a, as a Scandinavian man. And, and both of those things are in my DNA, right? So I have both, both of those lineages in my, in my body. And so it really makes me think sometimes, like, maybe we're just, like, getting messages from our bacteria or our dna maybe it's just cellular memory maybe. that we're seeing no? yes. it, because yeah. yeah and it could be everything it could be yeah. we're holding that physically you know and it's an ancestral thing and that there is this in intentionality with the lineage that we choose from a soul right. perspective the right. human lineage it's interesting too your name clementine moss and i understand moss is your married name right yeah but that's two right. very earthy words it sounds like fruit fungus doesn't it <laughs> no well moss i think of as very scandinavian because it, when mm -hmm. i first started this podcast i actually had a co-host the first i don't know year or so alessandra and she's swedish uh -huh. and so she would join from sweden and i was in america but i remember her telling this story once of going into the forest and just laying down on the moss and we had a guest on and we were both like, okay, let's just not talk and let's just be in the moss, you know, because uh, it just sounded oh, so yeah. amazing. And now anytime I hear moss, I think of her laying on this luscious moss. It sounded like a fairy forest. Oh, um, man. And, wow. But your name is awesome. And they're, but they're both so earthy, earthy. you know, like earthy, uh, yeah. natural yeah. things that we find in nature. <laughs> and Clementine being like orange. And then you've got this like Nordic with the red hair. And 
all of it. It's like, it's just really interesting. All the different like data points. We were talking about data points before we started recording. Right. But there's right. a lot with you that that like reinforces other parts of you. It's really interesting, <laughs> like a a parfait, many layers. You know, if you've seen Shrek, it's like I'm like an onion. It's like no, I'm like a parfait. <laughs> it's like what kind of layered thing do you want to be? Do you prefer onion? <laughs> do you prefer parfait? <laughs> I like that all those things are pretty nice things. I'm yeah. sure that there's a layer. They, I got a layer of gunk in there somewhere. Oh, don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all just moving through this human experience and trying our best. It's great. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah. I explored yeah. with another guest named Hillis, Hillis Pugh, and we were talking about um, names. Is Clementine your birth name? No. Oh, okay. You adopted that yeah. name. Uh -huh. Okay. It's a great name. But just talking about the power of our names and the sounds and the meanings and all of yeah. that, it's really interesting to step back and, and kind of look at that and how it, it applies to our lives. Are you a writer? Because it seems like names, like the fascination with names is always a sign of someone who's a writer. Ah, uh, yeah, I do like to write. I am writing a book right now. Yeah. Oh. Great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Let's talk about your book. Tell us a little bit about your book and uh, and what people can find in there. Yeah, it is a, it's a memoir and it is made up of a hundred little short pieces. And um, let's see, some of the themes in, it's the story of Clem how I came to be a drummer, uh, how I came to choose drumming at 27 years old. And then it's also a lot about the the connection between it's there's there are a lot of vignettes about a weekend of shows and how my meditation practice, my contemplative insight helps carry me through a weekend of driving and playing, all of the stuff right? And so there are road stories, and they're from the perspective of someone who's really gets pulled out of that place of stillness, and then how I come back to it, and how I get pulled out, and how I come back. And and so there are a lot of stories like that. It is a bit of a love story to my father, because he passed away right around the same time that I um, started meditating and, and learn how to play drums. So he never got to see me play drums. So so there are stories about coming to terms with our relationship in the book. There's some a lot about you know, what it's like to be in a female band. I my band I've mostly been in or the big bands in my life have been mostly female. So what it's like to work with other women. Great that is. Let's see. And it really is a love story to drumming. I just, I, drums are magic in my life. And so there's a lot, a lot about drumming. There's, a, of course, there's a lot about Led Zeppelin. And the book is divided by some exploration of Led Zeppelin songs. I picked, I think, 10 different Led Zeppelin songs that I've played um, and I have some thoughts about. So I use those songs as jumping point into other topics. Do you have a favorite Zeppelin song? Oh, don't know that I have a favorite. I have favorite ones that I play and favorite ones to listen to. A real favorite is probably When the Levee Breaks, um, because um, that song has been a pretty big deal for the band. It, it's the song we're most known for, and I love playing it, and it encompasses everything I love about John Williams playing. So. Oh, wonderful. I'm, there's a song, Tangerine. I love that one. Is that one Led Zeppelin or did they cover that? Uh -huh. It is they, they wrote that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. My dog is named Josephine and we oh. call her, I call her Josephine Tangerine and I sing that song to her all the time. So now I'm talking to Clementine who is in a Led Zeppelin tribute band and my mind is just blown. There are so many. <laughs> There's what so kind of dog is she? What kind She's of dog a mutt. She? Oh, She's yeah. a, an Australian shepherd, German shepherd, and has a bunch of other things in there too. Nice. Yeah. But I, yeah, my dog is in the book too. Henry the pug is, oh, makes a lot of, a lot of, appearances. there's a lot of him in there. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> love animals. 
Me too. This has just been beautiful, Clem. Thank Clem the Great. Thank you so <laughs> much for being on here. How can people find you? Uh, yeah, ClemTheGreat.com is great. Uh, the band is Zepparella, and the book is on Amazon. And I also, it's on Audible as an audiobook as well. So I read it. Oh, awesome. So yeah. that's going to be key because more and more people just want to listen to their books. So I love listening to books. Yeah, yeah. I, especially when the author reads it. You yeah. Know, there's something really special about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kara. Thank you.